Good evening. For those who don't know me, my name is Patrick McCauley. As a member of the advisory committee of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Zoom event. A particularly warm welcome to the many who are here for the first time. The Institute for Religion and Science was established seven years ago to promote the constructive engagement of religion, spirituality with science technology and to encourage a dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science, and civil. To this end, we sponsor lectures, a reading circle, and other events. Do check our website for resources, particularly for past videos and for our blog. Also, be sure to sign up for our mailing list, which can help you stay aware of upcoming programs. Tonight's event is part of a three event series sponsored by the Institute. We encourage you to attend our final event on March, March 15th. And first, we'll offer a presentation entitled, Can AI Systems Be Persons? Also, after our lecture tonight, we will break up into a small breakup room, breakout rooms for small group discussion. During that time, please write your questions in the chat so we can engage with them when we all get back together. And now I will pass it on to Sister Kathy Duffy, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Patrick. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce um, and to welcome back this evening's lecturer, Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld, mathematician, computer scientist, and theologian. Noreen was with us in 2016 then in person. And now, Noreen, we are so pleased to have you back with us again. Noreen is the Nicholas and Bernice Reuter Professor of Science and Religion at St. John's University and the College of St. Benedict, both in Collegeville, Minnesota, where she brings together her unique combination of perspectives as both computer scientist and scholar of Christian spirituality. She holds degrees in both computer science and mathematics from the Pennsylvania State University and a PhD in theology from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. So she is very well equipped to address a variety of topics in technology, and also to focus on how those, these uh, technological issues interfaith with the three Abrahamic traditions of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Noreen is also a research associate at the Institute for Philosophical Studies in Kulper, Slovenia, and writes for the Avon Hills Salon at avonhillsalon.com. She's the author of several books and editor of Religion and the New Technologies. Her latest title is The Artifice, the Artifice of Intelligence, Human and Divine Relationship in a Robotic World. Some years ago, our Institute Reading Circle truly enjoyed one of her earlier books, in our image, artificial intelligence and the human spirit. Tonight, Dr. Hertzfeld will focus her remarks on our relationship with computers. For instance, she'll ask, can we have a truly authentic relationship with our devices? And what does it take to have such a relationship? With a non-human being, such as a pet, with another human person? or with God? Can we love an AI? And if we do, will it ever love us back? We're truly blessed to share in the fruit of Noreen's years of reflection. And so tonight I ask you to welcome Dr. Noreen Hertzfeld to the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. Noreen. Thank you. 
And I'm going to share my screen here. Well, um, thank you all for coming tonight. And I am really sorry that we are not all together in person. Um, I think as I talk, you will begin to understand why. I want to begin my talk tonight with a story. I want to begin with a story that I'm sure uh, several of you have probably heard before. So a mother is putting her son to bed and uh, she's getting to the point where she's going to turn out the light and leave. And the child says, oh, mom, please don't leave. Um, I'm afraid. And the mother says, you don't need to be afraid. Jesus is always with you. And the child says, yeah, I know, but I want someone with skin. <laughs> and uh, my question tonight really is, um, well, how important is that? Uh, if we look at science fiction, we see all sorts of different types of relationships with AI, some without any skin, some with metallic skin, uh, some with pretty human looking skin. Okay, and in all of these, if we go through all of these stories, they're all about relationship. Okay, the AI is not there to be a tool, it's there to be a partner, a friend, a lover even. So here's the question, is it real or is it just anthropomorphization? What makes a relationship real? Okay, now AI is not the first place that anyone is looking for relationship with something it doesn't have skin. Uh, for example, we probably all experienced this. You know, we have our teddy bears. Is AI just a sophisticated teddy bear for grown-ups, Or is it something more than that? I wanna look at that question tonight. And I'm going to use the theologian Karl Barth to examine it. Karl Barth in his huge uh, opus, Church Dogmatics, talks about what makes a relationship authentic. And he says there are four parts to a truly authentic relationship, and these are them. So first, you have to look the other in the eye, then speak to and hear the other, aid the other, and do it gladly. So let's take a quick look at how well an AI, both AIs that we currently have, like ChatGPT, and AIs that we dream of having, how well can they meet these four criteria? So start with number one, look the other in the eye, okay? Um, we might say, well, we could do that at least with robotics. Uh, and the more we make uh, humanoid robots, the easier it is to look them in the eye. Um, the question of course is, what are we really looking at? When Bart says, look the other in the eye, why is this important? He says it's important because when we do that, we are acknowledging the being of the other. We are acknowledging the otherness of the other. Um, we are acknowledging the presence with us. Now, a lot of us have gotten used to, especially in these you know, pandemic years, not being able to look the other physically in the eye. Um, we can look each other in the eye through screens, through avatars, and uh, we could say, well, I, I certainly know the person is present there, but I miss a lot, don't I? I mean, we all have felt that if we really had a choice between safely meeting in person or meeting over Zoom, 
we're going to choose to meet in person. Um, there's body language, there's presence when you're close to someone. Physically, there's even different senses like smell. Um, it's different than being in someone's presence, but mediated through a machine. What about speaking to and hearing the other? Okay, so there we have Alexa. Go ahead, I'm listening. And the problem with Alexa is she's always listening. And this is one of the problems, again, with speaking to and hearing the other. In general, I would say computers are getting pretty good at this, right? Um, they listen to us. They're pretty good at recognizing what we're saying to them. Uh, they speak back, whether it's in written words or Alexa or Siri speaking back vocally. Um, but there are a couple of things. Okay, one is when we're speaking uh, to Alexa, or even when we're not, but we've got Alexa on this machine, then we don't know when Alexa's listening or when Alexa isn't listening. So the real question is, if you combine number one with number two, you know who you're speaking to and you know in general who is hearing you. Nowadays, we don't know who we're speaking to and who is hearing us and who is going to remember what we said and who might remember what we said a couple of years down the road. So there's a difference in speaking to and hearing when it's not in person, when it's not combined with number one, that looking the other directly in the eye. And once again, as we speak, again, through a computer, we're losing aspects of that speech. We're losing, again, you know, seeing the body language that goes along with it. Um, and this is one of the reasons why somebody like uh, Alexa or ChatGPT are really bad at irony and sarcasm because they can't see the facial expression at the same time. Um, they don't pick up on little bits of inflection that we do. So we kind of know when someone's being sarcastic. In general, they don't. Okay. Um, ChatGPT, of course, now is kind of our, our newest interlocutor. Um, and I imagine all of you have been reading about ChatGPT, who will say with great confidence uh, a bunch of nonsense. The last time I gave a talk, I was in Slovenia, and the director of the talk looked me up and then asked ChatGPT to write my introduction. Uh, it was a wonderful introduction. ChatGPT had me as getting international awards that I've never gotten. It had me writing several books that I've never written. And I thought, gee, damn, I like this guy, you know, <laughs> whoever ChatGPT is. Sydney, I guess. Uh, but uh, it wasn't the truth. And uh, so this is a big area of concern right now. And I think the biggest concern is that it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people when ChatGPT is more fully integrated into search engines as Microsoft is doing right now with Bing to know what to trust, uh, to know when what they're getting back truly is good information and when what they're getting back is absolute nonsense. Um, but it sounds very convincing. And the problem is, if we don't know if we can trust our search engines, we don't know if we can trust what we're being told by the machines, will we also come to a point where we don't know what we can trust when we are being told something by each other? Okay, so let's go on to number three, aid the other. Okay, here I think we have a point where we could say, oh yeah, AI really excels at this. I mean, we have the Mars Rover, for example, uh, machines that can go places that we can't go, do jobs that we don't want to do, even if it's just your Roomba doing the vacuuming, 
you know, it's it's handy to have robots do things that we can't or don't want to do. But these real robots are primarily tools. What happens when we move from the robot being primarily a tool to being more of a companion? You know, so there you can see a picture of an, an elderly person um, who maybe has a robot companion uh, who reminds her when to take her pills and when to drink more water and maybe play some games with her and things like that. Um, that's fine. But at what point do you say, mm, is this full aid? And is this aid that is getting in the way of the aid that we would normally give other human beings? Um, this is, in a way, my biggest worry. The first would be that the person with a robotic companion becomes so used to that companion that they prefer it over human company. Um, Sherry Turkle has written about robotic uh, lovers and saying, well, they could provide love that is safe and made to measure. But love is never meant to be safe or made to measure. It's meant to make us grow. It's meant to pull us out of ourselves, to pull us out of our comfort zone. Would a robot, whether it's a companion for the elderly, a babysitter for children, or a robotic lover, be too safe? too tailored to the user. And then the second is, if, as robots take over these companioning jobs, and they will, what will that take away from people? In other words, will the grandchildren then think, well, I don't need to visit grandma, you know, she's got Sporty the robot. Um, she doesn't need so many visits. Um, will the people who would normally take care of each other, all of us, will we lose the opportunity to grow in patience, to grow in love, to deepen the virtues that come to us from taking care of another person, from aiding them? This is a question that uh, Shannon Valor and others are starting to ask. Well, the other thing is you can say, who's doing the aiding? If a computer is aiding someone, is it really the computer? Is it really the robot? Or is it the programmers behind the computer, behind the robot? In other words, do the computers have any agency of their own? Or are they merely a front for some human agency? Well, in general, we say an agent has internal choice, which means they have mental states. Um, if we go back and look at some philosophers here, Daniel Dennett has said, well, we could say a computer has mental states um, because it's the state of its CPU. If CPU is analogous to a brain, then the state of the CPU is its mental state. It makes choices based on the state of its CPU. So yeah, computers have agencies. We can call them agents. Now, John Searle says no. He says, really, there's no metacognition here. In other words, Searle has a famous experiment where he says, suppose I am in a room and I've got the most wonderful Chinese English dictionary in the world. It does not only words, it does phrases and expressions pretty much at the touch of a button. And someone is passing questions in, in Chinese. And I'm hitting this button uh, and my, you know, machine is then saying, okay, here's the appropriate answer to that. In a way, it's sort of like a Chinese chat GPT. Okay, so here comes the question. I hit the button, out goes a plausible answer. He said, you know, I am running this. The person outside the room thinks I speak really good Chinese. I don't understand a word of Chinese. 
Okay, there's no metacognition. There's no uh, model, mental model of what's going on. It's just questions coming in, answers going out. This is exactly the way um, deep learning models work. They don't have a vision of the world. You know, they simply look at, oh, I got asked this question. Where in the past has this question been asked and answered? And I will find the answer. Um, if I need to give a longer answer, well, what would after this sentence statistically be another good sentence to follow this up by? Um, but the program has no cognition. It doesn't know what the questions are about. It doesn't know what the world is like or about. And it is just sending back plausible answers. So Searle would say, ChatGPT does not have agency because it doesn't really have internal choice because it doesn't have a model of the world. It's only doing what statistically ought to be done next. There's a second question, which is how much agency should the computer have? Okay, um, generally my students in computer ethics, which are feeling pretty comfortable with a lot of autonomy and a lot of agency, um, when they see these Boston dynamic dogs that are busy opening doors and such, um, they start saying, ooh, that's a little creepy. Then when they see the Boston dynamic dog with a payload of a gun on its back, they say, well, God, that's even creepier. It can open doors, it can move around on its own, and now it's got a gun. You know, this raises a big question. Uh, oh, I put a little picture of little toy tank robots there. Um, I could have put a picture of a uh, Russian Kalashnikov tank, you know, that uh, is equally autonomous and say, is this something that we really want? Weapons that are mobile, that uh, can work together in teams, um, that can open doors that uh, that are carrying a, a lethal payload. Um, you know, so far drones have generally been operated by an operator. And the interesting thing is that drone operators have just as high a statistical rate of PTSD as soldiers who are actually on a battlefield. Um, but once we have autonomous weapons that are not only moving autonomously, but that are autonomously making the decision of when to shoot, when to fire, who to fire at, you could say, well, that's good. Then we won't have drone operators getting PTSD. But it also means that we have taken warfare one further step away from the battlefield. You know, we first moved soldiers, many of them physically off the battlefield when we developed the airplane, the ability to drop bombs, the ability to fire from the sky. Um, drones have taken it a step further where we don't even need a pilot in the air over the battlefield. They can be sitting in a bunker in Nevada and uh, firing drones uh, in the Middle East, let's say. Um, autonomous weapons will go one further step. They will not just take people physically off the battlefield, but mentally off the battlefield as well. Do we want to do that? Because the further one is taken away from their enemy, the easier it gets to kill. Next question, can the computers be moral agents? We say, well, they can be agents. You know, they can, they can make some decisions autonomously. Um, the philosopher Susan and Michael Anderson have said, well, there are four things you need to be a moral agent. You're not under someone else's direct control. You interact with the environment in a deliberate way, fulfill a social role, 
and a cognizant of the responsibility inherent in that role. Now, AI is very good at uh, one, two, and three, we can say. Uh, you might say, well, they're kind of under the control of their programmer, but they're not under direct control. The programmer may not even know exactly how the AI is going to react in a given situation. They do interact with their environment in a deliberate way, and they can fulfill a social role. You know, as you see the robot here, who's helping the gentleman you know, down the uh, hallway. But number four is an issue cognizant of the responsibility inherent in that role. Right now, that is impossible for an AI. Um, they cannot feel a sense of responsibility, understand that they have any responsibility, or even know what their role is. And of course, their programming could be changed overnight, which will change their role and the way they interact with the environment. And that brings us to number four, do it gladly. Bart said that number four is really important for all of one, two, and three, that we gladly aid the other, that we gladly speak to the other, that we are gladly recognizing the presence and the humanness and the being of the other. So question is, can Roxy do it gladly? Okay. And do we want her to? What does it mean for a robot to do things gladly? Now here we're gonna run into some issues. First is the gladly means that you're doing something and you weren't coerced to do it. You're doing it freely. You've chosen to do it yourself. Now, this actually conflicts with the very root of the word robot, because the word robot comes from robota, which is Old Church Slavonic, for servitude, forced labor, or drudgery. In other words, robots are meant to be our servants our slaves in a way. And so it raises the question, when we build a robot, when we build an AI, what are we looking for when we look for AI? Are we looking for a partner or are we looking for a tool? And I think one of the problems that we're running into right now is we're not clear about the answer to this question because in a way we want both. We want AI to be our tool to serve us, to do what we ask it to do for us. At the same time, we want it to be a partner. We want to have a relationship with it. Um, but, you know, we have a problem. If we go back to Roxy here, are we looking for a sex slave? Or would it be okay for Roxy to say, yeah, sorry, sorry, I got a headache tonight? Or you want me to do what? I'm not gonna do that. In other words, we want, in Roxy's case, love that's safe and made to measure, or at least sex that's safe and made to our specifications. And yet at the same time, because we are built to be relational beings, we want a relationship with something that looks that human, that acts that human, and that takes on human roles. And so on the one hand, we want a tool. We want a servant. On the other hand, we want a partner. To do something gladly, you need to have emotion. And uh, here are the four stages of emotion that are put forward by the psychologist, Jerome Kagan. And he says, an emotion has four stages. First, we perceive a stimulus. Then we have a change in feeling that is sensory. We appraise both the stimulus and the change in feeling in our body 
and we formulate a response. Many of the terms that we have for different emotions actually come from bodily responses. Um, and when you think about an emotion, you know, suppose you are out walking, it's late at night, you have to go down a dark alley or a dark section of a street, and you hear a noise behind you. Your body is going to go into fight or flight mode. You're going to get that shoot of adrenaline, you know, um, long before your cortex clicks in and says, oh, my gosh, I think I'm being followed. What should I do? OK, then you're into appraisal mode. But the feeling comes first. Or think about empathy feeling empathy for someone. Suppose you're uh, on a train and you see uh, an elderly lady gets on and she's got a suitcase. She's trying to get it up into the rack. She's having difficulty with that. So you perceive the stimulus that she's having trouble getting it into the rack. But you also feel, you feel a kind of a, a warmth, a kind of a um, pity maybe. Um, you appraise both what you saw and what you feel, and from that, you make a response. Now, let's think about AI. AI is pretty good at number one. It can perceive stimuli. It's pretty good at number three. It can appraise the stimuli, and it can make a response. What it can't do is number two. Number two is missing. It's not going to have a change in feeling that is sensory because it hasn't got a body. Okay. Now, um, if we think for a minute about people, well, there are people who actually don't feel a lot of emotion. They perceive stimuli. They appraise them and think, oh, what should I do in this circumstance? What's the socially correct thing to do in this circumstance? Or what do I want to do in this circumstance and respond? And we call people like that sociopaths. So would a relationship with an AI be like a relationship with a sociopath? You have to ask that question. Emotion needs a body. And I think we've all recognized that, or we wouldn't use these silly emojis all the time. So even the response part, you know, we can go back to this and say, well, okay, I can see where two and three need the body. We need the change in feeling that is sensory. And the appraisal shouldn't be just of the stimulus. It should also be of what we have felt on noting that stimulus. So two and three. But really, we need the body for number four, too. And I think we all know that. And that's why when we want to give a response to someone, we stick these in. We also know that it's different to talk to someone, to relate to someone, not through a computer, but Again, kind of coming back to number one, body to body. And when computers try to approximate this, we often fall into something called the uncanny valley. Most people find if they're relating to Asimo there in the center, who is clearly a robot, or relating to one of these very humanoid robots on either side, that over time, they'll feel more comfortable with Asimo than with the other two. The reason for that is that robots that are made to look almost human, but not quite, elicit something atavistic in us. I think it is something that has been built into us by evolution to say, if you see a human body and it doesn't look quite right, or it doesn't act quite right, you might want to keep your distance. 
Okay, it might be the person might be dead, in which case there might be something wrong there that you don't want to uh, get involved with. Um, the person might, um, you know, not not be right. Um, it's something in us that when something seems just a little bit off, it bothers us. Uh, so making robots really humanoid, the idea is, well, they'll be easier for us to relate to. But we find that for many people, no, they become harder to relate to. Closer we get to skin, but not skin. So as I mentioned before, servant or partner, which do we want? We want both. We can't have both. So I think we need to ask the question, well, we can't have both, so which one do we really want? And I would say, well, then let's ask the question, which one can AI really do? And which one is AI really not very good at? And I think it's pretty clear. Computers are wonderful tools whether they have AI in them or whether they're just ordinary computers. Robots may make very good servants. But they're not going to make very satisfactory partners in the long run because they just don't share everything we need. When we look at Karl Barth's four points, each one becomes increasingly problematic. Okay, yeah, we can look a robot in the eye. We can look each other in the eye through the camera, through Zoom. We can speak to and hear the other. We can speak to Alexa, to Siri. We can ask questions of chat GPT and get answers. Computers can aid us and AI can aid us to do a number of wonderful tasks. AI can deal with huge sets of data that we can't deal with can't do it gladly. Why can't it do it gladly? Well, then we make a full circle back to number one because it's not embodied and it cannot have emotion. And as we're in Lent here, um, and it's time to do a little more theology, one of the things that Christianity brings to the table of religion religions is precisely the need for all four of these criteria for a full relationship. And so we believe that God took on a human body to fully share our condition, to know what our human condition was like. And Bart makes very clear that if you look at Jesus, you know, he did all four of these things to, you know, the nth degree. You see him always with the people. You see him always in the Gospels, surrounded like in concentric circles by his disciples, by the people that are following him, then by the multitudes of people. He speaks to them. But he doesn't just speak to them, he also hears them. And he hears them at a depth that we often don't. He listens very carefully. He aids them, he heals. Um, and he does it all gladly, including in the end, he takes up his cross and shares the end point of our condition. And this too raises a question about AI companions. How would we feel to have a companion that while we age, it doesn't? While we face death, it doesn't, okay? Um, would this make it harder for us to come to terms with our own aging process, with our own ultimate mortality. But we know that our God has had skin. We know that our God has shared our condition, that he knows what 
human frailty and human mortality is. And this is something that we do not share with an AI. Okay, now I'm going to end this way. Use a shameless plug for my newest book. It just was released today by Fortress Press and uh, basically goes into a lot more detail and with a lot more examples on these ways, these criteria for relationship and why ultimately embodiment is really important uh, to have a fully authentic relationship. So thank you for your attention. And now you get to go off to your breakout rooms. And, and it looks like it looks like everyone's back. So do we want to start with the questions? Let's so I'm, I'm going to thank Noreen for a really fabulous talk um, and a really thought provoking one. And if people have questions, if they'll put them in the chat, I'll try to field them. But right now we have three questions in the chat. Maybe I'll start with the, the long one, which is first and most important question. All true loving relationships, that is, I thou rather than I it, are by definition an exchange of desire, my desire to fulfill your desire, your desire to fulfill mine. According to this definition, is it not absurd to think of I thou with a machine, with something that totally lacks desire? Precisely. Yeah. I, I think that uh, this definition um, also fits very well with having the same um restrictions uh as with Karl Barts and that is it, you know desire sort of maps onto the do it gladly part and uh you can't have desire if you don't have emotion in fact um the uh psychologist Antonio Damasio has a couple of very good books out about the brain and emotion and he has studied patients who have had brain injuries in the places that control emotion. And some of them end up really with having no or very little emotion. And he said, you know, for them, making decisions, even something as simple as what should I have for lunch becomes torturously difficult because they have no desire. Mm. Because without mm -hmm. wanting something, on what basis do you choose? Now, I suppose they can just say, well, I'll always choose the lowest calorie one or, or whatever. But, you know, otherwise it's based by, okay, do you want the soup? Do you want the sandwich? You know, most of us kind of just sort of check in on, well, what do I feel like today? Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I want the soup. You know, without emotion, you don't have desire. And without desire, you have very little volition. Ah, yeah. And it's an interesting mm -hmm. connection between volition and, and desire. Yeah. Another another question. Are AI advances creating a desire in us to have an all-knowing parent to make all our decisions? Speaking of volition. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it's different for different people. I think there are those that want an all-knowing parent. Uh, there are those who would maybe rather have AI be sort of a child for them. Um, but societally, I think you might say, yeah, maybe we are. What I have thought, and this is from my perspective as a theologian, is that as a society, as we move further away from believing in God and believing in saints and angels, um, we still want to be in relationship with something that is other than human. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in some ways, um, this uh, kind of, you know, it gets lonely being the only thinking entity in the cosmos. So we either want to talk to the animals or we want to find ET or we want to build, you know, AI. So that, because we, you know, Augustine said, Lord, you've made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And I think we are made to be in relationship um, with an other that is not human. And when we don't find that in God, uh, we find that or we try to make it somewhere else. 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, another question. Today, at this point in evolution, humans have and need emotions. But what if you had an entity that wasn't a slave to emotions? What if emotions didn't cloud perception? You know, that's an interesting question. And it is one that is widely debated, particularly among those who are thinking about autonomous weapons. Um, there's a uh, professor at Georgia Tech called Ron Arkin, and he takes the position he works in their robotics lab and he works on autonomous weapons. And he has taken the position that uh, an AI soldier can actually be more moral on the battlefield than a human soldier because a human soldier will have all this emotion well mm -hmm. up in them and they might very well, you know, fire out of revenge because their buddy got shot or they might. Uh, work out of fear, but that the robot wouldn't feel fear, wouldn't feel anger, um, and therefore could, wouldn't commit war crimes the way human soldiers do. And I think that is one way of looking at it. Okay, but the other way of looking at it is that we, when we are faced directly with our enemy, often don't shift. Now, yeah. they found that the numbers of soldiers in various wars in the 20th century, where they've been able to go back and study, um, that an awful lot of them never fired their weapons um, or fired them into the air. Uh, they're finding actually right now that a number of Russian artillery shells seem to be being fired at random basically into empty fields. And they're asking, okay, either they're just super bad at targeting <laughs> or you're having artillery people that just, they don't want to kill mm -hmm. the Ukrainians. So, you know, it, the emotion in human beings, it, it can work both to the good and to the bad. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the, the first thought that occurred to me is, right, if you don't have the need to kill for revenge, but you also don't have the empathy to look at someone and say, I'm not going to kill. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that that cuts cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. um, Pat, Patrick wonders if there might be a way for AI to begin to manifest desire and care. Can AI determine it's their own individual ultimate concern, so as to begin to judge against and then decide? Certainly not any AI that we currently have. Mm. Certainly not with the technology that we currently have. We also want to be very careful about trying to give AI an ultimate concern uh, and make it too autonomous but to function on this concern because in general, we're not, you know, it's sort of like King Midas, you know, you get what you asked for, but it might not have been what you wanted. Mm -hmm. And in fact, following the story of King Midas, who, you know, said he wanted everything he touched to turn to gold. And so he got that and then he couldn't eat because all his food turned to gold. Um, <laughs> people have said, well, what if we give AI an ultimate concern? And so to be simple, let's just say we tell AI, just get as efficient as you can at making paper clips. You know, then how are we going to stop it from making paper clips? In other words, this AI might then decide, okay, well, now I need to cannibalize the, the whole world to turn it all into paper clips because paper clips is my ultimate concern. Um, you know, mm -hmm. For human beings, uh, made in the image of God, ultimately being in relationship, loving relationship with God and with each other should be our ultimate concern. And uh, we'd like to hope that because the image of God is within all of us, that if you dig down far enough, that is every human being's ultimate concern. But that would not necessarily be the ultimate concern of an AI. Yeah, 
I mean, would AIs believe in God, I guess, would be the the question that might follow that one. Well, I mean, we can tell them to believe in God, but, you know, you have to recognize that right now, all the AIs we have, you know, whether it's Minder, the AI priest, uh, whether it's the Buddhist uh, pepper chanting funeral chants, whether it's chat GPT spouting out all sorts of things or telling a reporter from the New York Times that he ought to leave his wife, you know, because he really loves Chad GPT more. Um, there's no there there. I mean, there, there's nothing inside. There's no conception of God. There's no conception of self. There's no conception of the world. There aren't the kind of mental models that we have in our heads. We don't, well, yes, we sometimes just decide, well, what words should I say? Oh, you know, uh, a friend of mine is hurting and we rack our brains for just, well, what are the right words to say? Um, but if we just say them and we don't actually, you know, like Bill Clinton used to say, I feel your pain, you know, we don't actually feel the other person's pain. They're just words. And with AI, it's all just words. There's nothing, nothing, nothing underneath. Um, another question, good, good night, Oppie, the two robots on Mars and the love and the feelings of the NASA scientists. I wonder how humans are studied in their relationship with AI. Seems like it's a both and in the development of both the, I think, both the robots and of the scientists. Well, it is. Um, humans develop feelings for their AI, but humans develop feelings for their teddy bears, you know. Um, a lot of it is projection. Uh, in fact, I would say at this stage of the game, it's all projection because there's no emotion, there's no feeling. There's no sense of self, there's no sentience, there's no consciousness in the AI. There's no worldview. Um, so what we do is we project uh, our feelings onto it. Um, and we do that to a greater or lesser extents with all sorts of things. I mean, I've named my car. I call it impunity that way. <laughs> My <laughs> friend suggested that. He said, that way you can drive wherever you want to with impunity. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, it's, we get a lot of snow here in Minnesota. We got about two feet on the ground right now. And, you know, and I'm having trouble getting up to, we get finally to the top of a difficult snowy hill. I'm like patting him on the dashboard and saying, oh, good boy, <laughs> you made it. Um, we project because we are such relational creatures. Yeah, we really long long for that relationship. We do. Yeah, do any studies show that AI stimulates active imagination and critical thinking? Uh, I don't think we have a lot of studies. Um, I think there will be such studies. I think a lot of the programs that might stimulate active imagination, I'm thinking right now of DALI, the program where you give it a prompt and it, it makes a picture, builds a picture based on that prompt. So if I say, you know, I want to see uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, riding on the back of a dolphin in Hawaii, you know, it'll build that picture. If I want to say, now I want to see it in the style of Van Gogh, it'll build that picture. I think there's some room for creativity here. Um, what I fear is again, it's like so often AI is, it's, it's a double-edged sword, right? You know, like we said earlier about, uh, about the AI uh, robotic soldiers. Yeah, they won't fire out of anger, but they won't not fire out of empathy. Well, I think something like DALI is also a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it might stimulate a sort of creativity, like thinking of creative prompts, okay? Mm -hmm. um, 
it might be a good tool for people who aren't artistic at all to put together some vision that they have, but it might also stifle human creativity because you have to remember that the AI itself, while in a way it's creative at creating pastiches, it's not creating anything new. It's not mm -hmm. going to come up with a new style all of its own but it can do neat things, you know, like uh, Queen Elizabeth on the back of a dolphin in the style of Van Gogh. Um, you know, you can ask it to do something postmodern or whatever, uh, but it's always copying. It can only work with the material it has and the material it has are things that we have already done. I would hate to see a lot of graphic artists go out of business or a lot of young people decide, oh, I'm not going to study art, even though I love art, because there's, everything's going to be done by a computer, I'll never get a job. Um, I don't want to see us lose our artists. I mean, I feel pretty strongly about that, too. And I, I keep imagining it's like a basis set, right? If you don't have a big enough basis set, you'll never create anything. And, um, and with the basis set, you'll never create anything outside of that. It's its own little its own little world. Mm -hmm. um, is AI contributing to humanity's technological trance? Hmm. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, I think, uh, you know, at the moment right now, everybody's just wowed with uh, these chatbots. Um, and uh, I think one of the things I worry about and I worry about this mostly with young people, is that the technological trance that they can fall into either by playing video games all day or by being on social media all day. Um, AI is their appearance. only going to make that uh, stronger because it's gonna make video games even more appealing you know, chatbots are going to, we don't even know how many people we relate to on Twitter now are chatbots, you know, many, many are. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, sometimes wonder, you know, in an argument, who, who's, who am I arguing with? Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's not, not always, not always clear. We may have come to the end of the questions, actually. There are a few comments in here. Um, AI will believe in God only if its creator believes in God. Like anything we get our hands on, we'll use it for positive or negative purposes, which I think is, you know, kind of abundantly clear that, you know, everything we create is a, um, you know, two-edged two -edged sword. Um, Chinese are limiting their kids to 40 minutes a day. And... Um, I use a lot of c computational stuff in my classes. And so I have colleagues who say, oh, they have to turn off all their devices. But I point out I have to teach mine how to use their devices for what we're doing without getting distracted by the other things. Mm -hmm. so, you know, two, two ways to play that. One is, you know, make them put them in a box at the door. And the other is, you know, how do we manage it? Um, and two, Unfortunately, two though, the, the distraction part is difficult. Ooh, I, I yeah. find that even myself, if I've got my phone and I'm at a talk or something and I haven't turned it off, or if I'm in a rather boring committee meeting, uh, it's just mm -hmm. so tempting to pull that phone out and take a look and see if, you know, are there are any emails or something interesting on there. Yeah, no, it's made me very aware of my my phone and my various email and other things that I have open on my computer when I'm in class because I'm really trying hard to model, right? Not not looking at my email. And yeah. um, so someone's asked another question, and maybe this will be our last question. Um, is AI going to objectify women even more through the dolls, et cetera? Yes. In fact, if you look at the current things that are in development or the current things that we already have, um, if you think about Siri and Alexa, you know, it's it's not George and Mike, you know. Um, now, with some of them, you can change the voice. With some of them, you can't. 
Um, I, I would love to change the voice in my car because I think of impunity as, as being male, but it's got a female voice and I can't change it. Um, <laughs> but generally, these things are designed because we want them to be sort of the perfect servant partner. Mm. Well, what do, first of all, most of the programmers are men, and what do they think of as the perfect servant partner? <laughs> And so culturally, they give them a woman's voice. And as they build, you probably noticed most of the very humanoid looking robots, except for one, which was the um, developer, Ishiguru in Japan, actually made after himself. So it's mm -hmm. a model of himself. But otherwise, they're all women. And the mm -hmm. sex bots are, are all women. <laughs> because in our society, the woman has been the ideal of the perfect servant partner. Mm. Yeah, and all the caregivers, right? And the caregiver, yeah. And I think I may have the last question to Patrick who says, do you think an AI bot used as a companion to an elderly person is ethically dubious? Uh, you know, I think there's kind of a, a span um, I think I, I've written about this. In fact, I have a, a paper coming out very soon about this topic. Um, I think non-humanoid robots uh, could be helpful. I think they already find them helpful in nursing homes to deliver medications or trays or things like that. They're used in hospitals. Um, but I do think think there are areas where it becomes mentally dubious, I think, or ethically dubious. I think using them with those who have some dementia is ethically problematic because they may not really know or understand what they are dealing with. They've been used in nursing homes with people who have dementia simply to calm them down. Um, like there's a sort of robotic seal that called Pero that they've given to Alzheimer's patients. Um, I think having a, the robot that's kind of like a pet, like an animal, where you think, well, it might be hard for that person to like hold a real cat or dog, but they can hold this furry robot and they feel calmer. I, I think that's okay. But I think giving them uh, a very humanoid caregiver raises a lot more questions. Um, it raises the questions of, are you trying to trick them into thinking this is an actual person? Um, it raises the question of, are you taking away time with real human beings? and using this as a cost-saving measure to hire less staff and to have less personal interaction. So to some extent, I would say, uh, you know, if it's an and, you've added a robot, but you've not taken anything else away, you're probably okay, especially if the robot is clearly a robot. If it's an or, using it instead of human caregivers, then I think you're going into difficult territory. Yeah, thank you. Well, I wanna thank Noreen for the wonderful talk and for all the interesting answers to the questions. And I wanna thank everyone for all the great questions in the chat. Um, the Perhaps the best part of these talks is the sort of conversation that they stimulate. So thank you so much, Noreen. Well, and thank you, my pleasure. I'm going to turn it back to Kathy, I think. Yes, that's right. And as soon as I get my act together here, <laughs> um, let's see. I'm gonna... And uh, while Kathy does that, I'm going to ask Noreen where we can best find her book. Right. Um, well, it's published by Fortress Press, but I'm sure you can find it on Amazon. Amazon, probably. <laughs> I'm sure Amazon will <laughs> Tell me I want it. But uh, if you're not a fan of Amazon, um, go to Fortress, Fortress yeah. Press. Okay, we'll, we'll do. Thank you. All right. So I just want to thank you also, uh, Noreen. It's been great having you back. And uh, I hope when you're in Philadelphia, we will see you. <laughs>
But um, I, and congratulations on your book, and I think we should all think you know publicize it, you know, get it out there on the airwaves because it it it, it is an important topic. And so, thank you for for sharing with us. Thank you. Best wishes. All right. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. It was thank great you. to see. Thank you. Friends. Thank you. Kathy, remind <laughs> them you. of the um, event on uh, March fifteenth. Right, that was the point. Uh, yeah, that we have one more in this series, one more event on March twenty first. Uh, and force and first, who's uh, had some experience working with these humanoid uh, robots, and her question is, can uh, AI systems be be a person? So it's somewhat the same topic, but probably you know certainly a different take on it. So please come back. <laughs> And we'll see how it all fits together. Okay. Kathy, can you double check that date? I have the 15th here. That's wrong. It's the 21st. Okay. Okay. I keep telling you the 15th. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it is the 21st, all right? Okay. And uh, you know, be sure to register and uh, we'll keep in touch, all right? Thank you. Marie, why don't you stay on just for a minute? And Patrick. Uh, okay. okay. So, all right. So good night and uh, have a wonderful rest of the evening.